and I'm recording it. Uh, so we do have three of you here. Um, since you are watching it live, that does get you out of the discussion for this week, the one that was assigned this morning. Um, as last week's is due tonight. Uh, and I had, I, I knew we may have less on it, but then we haven't had a lot more anyway. That we've only had a couple more. So we'll go with this. But um, I had to change times on it. Last Thursday, I found out that um, the state office wanted me down here in Atlanta today and tomorrow for a Amazon AWS information and training session. I'm on a I'm chair of a committee um, that's developing a new cloud curriculum for the state. The standards for it. Um, be a specialization and networking is the intentions at this point. Um, so they contacted me Thursday morning, right before lunch, actually. It was close to lunch and said they wanted me here. The school would let me come. Um, so I'm here that I've got a meeting at Winnet Tech this afternoon and all day tomorrow. So, um, that meant things had changed because it actually starts at 1230. So um, the school went ahead and sent me down here last night and put me in the motel last night. And so then I could do the sessions this morning. And you all session obviously collided with me being in class this afternoon um, because you're normally at one o'clock. And so I moved you up to eight o'clock. To, and I had to get up a little bit earlier than I really wanted to this morning, like you said, the others. And so we're going to go ahead and do it. Um, so I've got those all scheduled this morning. People think when I go to these meetings that it's a break for me. <clears throat> I was grading some stuff last night, grading a bunch of stuff, uh, a bunch of time on Saturday. Um, and I was just grading some stuff just now before I joined back in. Um, so, um, at this point that we're going to be on the Ethernet chapter this week. Um, also, your second test is this week. So you've got the test on modules four through seven, and that's due next Monday. Um, so I'm going to flip over. And I'm going to flip back and forth as I look at the curriculum. So I'm not going to catch all's questions if you put questions up there necessarily in media, but I'm going to try to flip back and forth. Um, let's see if I. OK, I can actually enlarge this. And then I can still see the. Um, chat window, so now I can still see what you are doing over there. OK, if there's anything. So this one's looking at the Ethernet frames, that Ethernet switching, and then they look at the frames, the MAC addresses, and a few things off that. Um, so, and I'm intending tonight to get this um, session downloaded so that I can put it into two hybrid classes because I won't be meeting with them tomorrow since I'll be in Atlanta. I, Tomorrow, that goes two times. And so I'm going to try to get this out there so they can watch it. Okay. Um, Ethernet layer, the Ethernet um, is going to fall on both the data link layer and actually it's going to fall more than that. Um, but where they're looking at it right now is in terms of the frames and that type of stuff. So they're looking at it on the data link layer and on the physical layer, which are the two layers we've already talked about in the class. Um, so they're talking about the Ethernet frame in here um, on it. And so they show you in terms of the data link layer, if you remember on the data link layer, I told you that's the only layer that um, has two sublayers to it. It's got the LLC sublayer and the MAC sublayer. And as we're looking at Ethernet, you can actually see 
where you've got the protocols that fit between the two different layers and the Ethernet's working on two different ones here. So the part of Ethernet that works on the LLC is the 802.2 um, protocol on it or standard on it. And there, that's going to be for communicating between the physical and the software stuff on up above. So you've got 802.2 that's involved with Ethernet. And then, and that's just for the communication between the two different parts of the whole thing. So that's communicating between the physical parts and the software parts. And remember the stuff, LLC and the software part, um, and the Mac and physical is physical items. So that's where 802.2 comes in. And that's, these are, um, I said protocols, but it's actually standards. Sorry about that. These are IEEE standards, which is the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Originally it was electrical people, and then as electronic stuff came along, they expanded what they do. Um, IEEE is a really large organization and covers a number of things. Besides being a, it's a professional organization for people in those, but it's also um, does unionizing and training of people for particularly in you know, electrical. Um, but it's the biggest thing out there for it is that it's a professional organization, which is what you're concerned about for it. And they set lots of standards involved in the things you're doing. So on the Mac sub layer and the physical layer, um, they mention here about that it uses um, a couple of different standards there. 802.3, 802.11, and 802.15. The 802.3 is the traditional one, and that gets into the wired connections on it. Um, so the, that one you'll quite often see on it. And I know in previous certification tests and stuff I took, I have to worry about 802.3 and 802.2 a lot of times. Um, and so those two would be out there. Um, the 802.11 has been around for a good while too. Um, I'm seeing more of it now in terms of cert tests. But um, it's an important one and one that you use also. So you're using 802.3 when if you've got wired uh, cabling around that, that's the Ethernet you use on the wired one on it. So you notice. Um, in the text, they tell you it's the, the standards for fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, et cetera. Fast Ethernet is the 100 um, megabit, and the gigabit is the 1,000 megabit or 1 gigabit, and then there's actually 40 and 100 gigabit out there also. So those are covered under that same one also, although the ones dominantly used out there in the world right now still is the hundred and the thousand. Um, but there is stuff out the 40 gig and the hundred gig. Actually, what was SunTrust Stadium, the Braves state, new stadium there in Atlanta, that's now Truist. It was SunTrust Park. Now it's Truist Park is what the newest name is that they just changed a few weeks ago. Um, because SunTrust merged with BBNP, um, they are actually running 40 gigabit um, service into the um, stadium. And when they built it three years ago, I guess it was, Cisco did not have the 40 gigabit, and that stadium is actually all Cisco stuff in it, except for their connection to the outside world, and they had to get Juniper a couple of um, the routers from Juniper to connect to the outside world because they brought in a 40 gigabit connection. And Comcast, if I'm remembering right, and I'm pretty sure that's correct, is the provider, therefore, um, of the internet service. Now, 802.11 is for wireless. So when you're talking about wireless, you're using 802.11 standard. If you, when you bought any wireless devices, um, actually, you see that standard number on them, and that's where you see the speeds on them. Um, nowadays, you're looking at AC, um, which is actually 802.11 AC, 
and then there was G and N and A and B out there. You're not going to deal with A and B nowadays, but um, AC is the one you really want to go with today. And actually, AC is now they're changing the name on it instead of referring to it as AC, which is actually the specific standard from IEEE. So it's 802.11 AC. The term they've gone to that you're trying to use now is that it is um, wireless six. Um, we'll see how that catches on of using a different term. And then there's going to be a lot of people convinced that it's a whole new standard sitting out there and a faster one than AC. Um, and so that's been developed out there. Um, and then 802.15, you'll see that one out there too. Um, the big place you'll see mentioned on it time on test certification, etc. And again, let me remind you, I have not looked at y'all's test that y'all have got in this class and it's new test. So I don't know exactly what questions you've got on it. But I'm going from past experience. 802.15 is dealing with Bluetooth and RFID. Um, you're near NPC near, gee, I can't remember what the P stands for, um, connection, um, that those all fall under the WPAN. Um, and that's a personal area network. And it's a wireless personal area network is why it's WPAN. WLAN is wireless local area network. And then the first one's really dealing with local area networks. Um, but Bluetooth is probably the biggest one that you are going to see things about there, but probably the one that's used more on it is more the RFID, but that doesn't get quite as much publicity, et cetera, on it, which is where you've got the tags on stuff in the stores and as things are shipped and everything that give off a signal to them to real close devices. And where you can do inventory of them, you can also protect your stuff in the store, et cetera. With it, there's some controversies on RFI. Um, so that comes into there. Um, with the, and then the other one, the NPC, and I'm pretty sure I got the right afraid on that one. That one you're going to see a little bit more of. Um, that, like, when you, if any of you happen to use your, um, Apple credit thing on it where you can actually wave your phone in front of certain terminals and stuff and charge your stuff using your phone or even on the um, vending machines at the college. Um, you're using the NPC to do that. Um, so those are the big ones off that. So that's those where the 802.2 goes with the LLC and then 802.3, 11, and 15 are all fit on the max sub layer and the physical layer. Questions on that? Okay. All right, good. And I am coming from y'all from my motel room here. So you got a little bit back, different background on me in here. Um, so then they go a little bit more on it on just the 802.3 and break that one a little bit more apart. And you notice it's got the different letters on it, including the gigabit Ethernet over fiber, which is Z. Um, and then the AB for the 3AB for a bit over copper and the 3U for fast Ethernet. Uh, those aren't that set of letters I don't really usually ever see out there and that I don't have those ones always that I'm dealing with. Um, Ethernet, uh, if it's using half duplex, it is using CSMACD, which we talked about in the previous chapter. Um, if it's doing full duplex, which it's actually doing, if it's 100 or faster, um, or definitely if it's 1,000 or faster, should be if it's 100 or faster. And if it is literally full duplex, then we really aren't going to have collisions occur, so then we go to CA. Although technically, we're still on CD. 
Um, but if it's full duplex, we don't have to worry about CSM A, C, D. So you won't have to worry about CSM A, C, D very much longer in the future. Um, they then talk about the Ethernet frame. Uh, we talked about the frame in the previous chapter. Notice it's the same stuff that we talked about right there. Um, so the, they mention on the, and it's just a specialized frame that is the ethernet one so it's got the preamble and the start field def um definition that's what that should be start field delimiter sorry about that um and we talked about that before on just frame and actually they've left it off here but um there is a stop field one at the end and i don't know why they left that off the illustration right here um so then it has the mac addresses which we talked about in the previous chapter and that is the source and the destination and i have both in the type and the length of the frame and the type since it's an ethernet frame it's going to have a type set for that and that they mention a couple of that the ones for ip version 6 ip version 4 arp um also in the other chapter i mentioned on a frame type to you that if you had a token ring network you were running on the frame the token when it gets passed around is a type of frame on it so there's a number of types of frames here they mentioned that it's telling you which version of ip you're using four or six or if it's doing or sending out an arp frame at this point requesting arp and arp is address resolution protocol that's used where the domain name is not the domain name the ip address is requesting to know what the mac address is for that ip address um and then the data field and that will vary in its length, which they note there's somewhere from 46 to 1500 bytes, where the data field is actually your packet. Okay. Um, and then they throw you PDU there. And I don't remember if it was this class or one of my two hybrid classes. I stumbled on PDU because I couldn't remember the U. Um, but packet data unit is actually the overall term for frames, segments, and packets. And packet data unit is a little weird one to be a generic one for something that also could be a packet. Um, so, and if your packet that it's putting in there, that data field that's encapsulating is too small, it actually pads it with additional stuff on the end of it, just blank stuff to get it up to the minimal size. And then the Frame check sequence field, I mentioned that in the previous chapter. It usually uses CRC, which is cyclic redundancy check. Um, and what it does is it does calculation on the field on the whole frame and puts the number in there. And it's not just adding up all the stuff. It comes back to it, truncates it and stuff and comes up with a number. At the other end, it does the calculation again when it's received and check to see if it's the same number that was inside the frame. If it is, then um, we can reliably say that it got there. Now, um, that doesn't absolutely mean it got there fully intact, but um, odds are it did because it's a very little chance that, um, because it says here in the material calculations match, no error occurred. Could have, as long as the error occurred where it doesn't change the calculation um very very slim possibility of that so this is the way to determine but if it doesn't match we know we got a problem we need it reset to us um so that's those all right then they go uh and y'all are going to use wireshark in this chapter and wireshark is a useful tool that's out there um for you to use to be able to look at things happening on the net <clears throat> network and so have fun with Wireshark. Wireshark, and it's a free product out there you can get and that you can do some neat things with of checking stuff on everything. Um, 
let me see what they've got on Ethernet MAC addresses because that should be. Okay, they mentioned the MAC address table, which the switch is going to keep. But it's going to keep a, a table of MAC addresses of knowing what the MAC address of the devices that are connected to each port. And also, it keeps in that MAC address table that it keeps track of when things come in, what MAC address did it come from, and which port did that go out on. Um, so it uses that to make forwarding decisions. Um, so this is done on layer two, and this is done with the frame and the MAC address. Okay. Um, so, and then they talk about, so they give you a little bit on that, but they don't give you much on MAC addresses because you already know about MAC addresses from the previous chapter. Now, forwarding of how it works with that. Let's see what all they threw you right here. It doesn't look like they really gave you much on that. Okay, they really didn't. Okay, um, because when the frames come in, that um, there is forwarding decision made of where does that frame go? Does it belong on this? Does it belong because we're um, working with switches? Does it belong here or does it need to send it somewhere else? So as it comes in or which port does it belong on on our switch if it belongs here? As it comes in, it's going to make a decision on that. Now, if there's a store and forward, which I don't see that mentioned right here, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you these two ways of forwarding, just for your information. Um, that store and forward says we get the whole frame in and then look at the frame. And then that it looks at the frame and determines what to do with it. Does it send it to a specific port on the switch or does it send it on to another um device out there so that's what's storing forward it brings the whole frame in and then looks at it um i forgot my term for the other one right at the moment um that there's another one that it's and forward that when it comes in, it gets the first little bit of it and looks at it. And remember, the MAC address is right there at the front. So all it needs is the first 64 bits on there, if assuming it's IP version 4. Um, actually, yeah. Um, that it's going to have the first portion of it. Um, then, then it's going to look at it at that point when it gets in enough that it has the address. Looks at that and goes on and forwards it. Um, the problem with that one is, the good part of it is it does it much quicker because it doesn't have to have the whole frame come in and then it starts forwarding it on out and shipping it on around. Um, the problem with it is, is that like um, runts and other things sitting out there in fragments that um, if they're floating around on the internet and you're using this one, that then it doesn't realize it's not a complete frame that there's missing stuff on the store and forward it actually checks the crc and then forwards it out on this one it just looks sees is there enough data there that i've got an address and it looks and proceeds to start forwarding and it's a fast forwarding on it however you will send runs and fragments on through the network on it because if they've got at least that amount of space on it it starts forwarding it um uh, because it's not doing a crc check on it whereas with store and forward it does do that on there all right um i'm not sure skyler if you would catch that off there or not um you could just you you could use your end map and um, command more likely and catch that one from nmap, but Wireshark, Wireshark might show it to you, I can't remember, it could be in one of the specialties on it, but as far as just checking traffic, it's not, and Wireshark's going to be looking at the traffic coming across, um, it's less 
likely probably to catch it, but it may be able to catch that. But NMAP would be a better one, I would think, to um, catch if I'm understanding what you're wanting. Okay. Um, so, but you may be able to do it for a circle also. All right. So that's with the, um, on that. Um, and so then as they come in, that um, it sees what's the MAC address and where did it come from? And it'll put that into the MAC address table. That now it knows that MAC address is associated with whatever port. And it builds its table there. And then when somebody goes to send to that MAC address, it looks at the table and goes, aha, I know where it goes because I've had something from there before. And it proceeds to forward it out on that immediately. Um, whereas otherwise, that um, is going to have to do some generic look, some more broadcast, and then forward out. So that will help on that one. And I'm just surprised they don't. Oh, there's forwarding methods. I didn't get that far. Okay. So that's the next part. Cut through. That's the one I wanted. Cut through switching is the second part of switching I was just talking about. So we mentioned about um, store and forward and then cut through switching is mentioned in here also. Um, and then they mentioned about duplex and speed settings. And I actually mentioned that one to you already. With half duplex, you're really at 10 megabits per second. Or you can do still on the 100, but 100 is usually preferred to be doing it a full duplex if possible. Full duplex says we can send and receive at the same time. And basically, you're running down two pairs of wires. Um, half duplex says we can only send or receive one at a time. We can't do both at the same time, but we can do both. So um, ham radio. Um, CB radio are examples of half duplex in real world. Telephone's an example of full duplex. If you're talking on the telephone, that um, you can both talk and hear each other at the same time. But if you were on a CB radio or a ham radio, if you're talking, you can't hear them. And if they're talking, they've got the mic button pushed. They can't hear you. So you can either talk or you can listen at the same time. So, um, and full duplex is a lot faster than the other. All right, auto MDIX, or you'll see it a day MDIX, usually with the dash after auto in it, after that A. What that does, and I mentioned it to you earlier in the course, actually. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more as you all go to make your cables, probably in a week or two. I'm gonna try to start setting that up. Um, I got to get through this week first. I may try to set that up for next week. So, um, and that y'all are going to have to come in and make cables this time. It's learning how to make them initially. You're going to make a straight through, crossover, and rollover. The straight through and crossover ones, um, that comes into play about connecting devices. Um, Straight through is used to connect devices on different layers of the OSI model. So switches can connect with a straight through to a PC or switches can connect to a straight through to routers. However, switches cannot connect to switches with straight through because what happens is, is that the switch has its receive and transmit pairs pins reversed from what's on the PCs and on the routers. Um, the crossover cable actually switches those out. Um, so when you build a crossover cable, y'all will switch pins one and three with pins two and six. And so it's switching them as it goes across the cable. Um, and so if you were wanting to hook a router to a router or switch to a switch, you've got to use crossover traditional. Um, if you want to hook a PC to a PC, always have to use a crossover. However, today's switches and routers generally have gone to that their um, RJ45 ports generally today are AMDIX on. And what that says is, is that is 
that when something's plugged into it, it looks at the signal coming in and sees which pair is it on. Is it on one and three or is it on two and six? And don't worry about those numbers right now. You'll see that when we go do the cables. But I'm just so that maybe it makes a little more sense when I say a specific pair of numbers right there. Um, that it looks and sees which one did it just receive on. So then it goes, OK, that's going to be what I receive on now from what I connected to. And I'll use the other pair to send on, which so the device at the other end is doing what it wants to do. Um, PCs do not have a MDIX ports on. That's just going to be on your switches and routers and your Generally, your more advanced ones, your more bottom level ones, it's not going to be on. And I've actually run into it on some high level ones that it wasn't. With a Barracuda firewall a couple of years ago, um, they included in the box with it a straight through cable and told me to use an Ethernet cable to get my router to the firewall. It wouldn't work. And I fought it for a little bit, and then I went, wait a minute. And I looked at the cable, and I went, this is a straight-through cable. I think I know what the problem is. And But uh, most of the time, you are finding AMDIX. And it turned out, nope, they didn't have AMDIX on that machine. And that you had to use a crossover cable to connect your router to the firewall, which is what you would normally do. Because um, stuff will come into your router, and then you pass it to the firewall. And then you pass it on into your network. Um, but they had a straight through cable there. And their direction said connect an Ethernet cable up. And I'm going, normally when people refer to an Ethernet cable, we're talking about straight through cable. That's what normally comes with all your devices, just like it did right there. But that wasn't the cable that was really needed in that case. But if you're connecting a switch that you bought, uh, wireless switch that you're going to use and you're going to connect it to your um, DSL or cable modem. Guess what? That DSL or cable modem is actually a router. You're doing switch to router, so straight through is exactly what works. Um, so that's what the auto MDIX is. It actually makes the world easier on us out there. Um, the memory buffering, they do mention that one. Um, then that gets back to the cut through switching and where it builds it it buffers it as it comes in and makes a decision on it. Um, let me look at that through switching real, real quick. Um, okay, so they got store and forward and cut through switching, but they don't have store and forward um, listed on their index. So they did have that that I talked to you about. So um, Cut through switching, they mentioned there is fast forward and there's fragment free switching. Um, where I mentioned about that with cut through switching, you could be forwarding fragments, but um, if you do it with fragment free, you look at this first 64 bytes of it versus if you just do um, the regular on it, you're, on, you're looking at a lesser amount of it where you just need to see the addresses. Um, Actually, in both cases on this, you're really not dealing with uh, um, CRC on it. You're only dealing with CRC on store and forward. And so that's the issue on that one. Um, but you can do with the cut through. It does have a fragment free approach available now that you could choose to do that. But that's going to be a little slower than your fast forward switching as far as cut through. Because fast forward looks like I said it, but you are for could be forwarding bad frames all right i think i have basically covered the chapter here well yeah um that i've covered the chapter through for you on chapter seven i get confused looking over here at the index and i started saw something else down here because like um that so we're going to get more into the addressing and everything in a couple of more chapters because it can be 11 before we get to ip4 addressing and 12 for ip version 6. um and that we're going to talk about arp which we mentioned in here when we get to module 9. okay questions for me today
So the there's not I've called it a midterm, but it's just a lab on it, and exactly what date we do it on doesn't make any difference um because there's really not any midterm dates around here or anything for you um so I'm thinking about maybe trying to do for next week um but I'm not sure, and it'd be later in the week before I even start scheduling on it. And that y'all just, I'll have different times on different campuses, or I'll just, or probably I'll just put out there when I want to do it. And that um, I'll be, and that y'all can come in and join the two classes that I do on campus for whichever day I do it on, or that we'll set up individual sessions for you. And I will go to the different campuses to meet with y'all on. Now it's going to be a little bit um, diff, um, trick on that as much on me pulling off the scheduling for it. Since I've got classes on Tuesday and Thursday, those days are full. Um, so going to other campuses during the day will be a little tricky. Monday, I've actually got these sessions all day on Monday. Um, so that pretty much leaves just Wednesday that I'll be able to travel around, um, although I can go to the evenings on one or two nights a week on it. Um, as I could go, I can't go on Tuesday because I'm booked on that night. Um, Monday night I know I could go on, and I think Wednesday and Thursday most weeks on it. That can. So I'll have to do a schedule on it, but it counts as a lab, but it is mandatory. Um, you because you've got to do the cable in final that is mandatory by Cisco and I've put in the syllabus um, out there that you have to do the um, midterm cabling which is when you learn how to do it um, that you have to do that on a day before you do the um, final cabling at least so there may be some people get scattered on out over the next few weeks on it i'd prefer to get it all done here prefer to get it done during march sometime but we'll have to see on that because the first week of march that on um, that thursday and friday are out because i've got the school will be shut down for two days we've got um faculty meetings and stuff on thursday and friday actually faculty to staff development on that thursday and then we got school-wide meetings all day that friday so um there's no classes on that thursday or friday that following week the second week i'll be in north carolina at two different conferences although i'll do these sessions that monday um is my intention and i'm not exactly sure when i'm gonna do this that week um because i'm hoping i'd like to be on the road at lunchtime by lunchtime so it may be early again like this one um and then the following week i'll be around and then at the end of the month that the week the 24th through the first or whatever the last i believe it's the last week of the month is when y'all have spring vacation so and i intend to take some time off then too so yeah because the 25th falls during that week and I actually start teaching a national class that week on Wednesdays um, at lunchtime on how preparing for the Network Plus certification exam, which is what y'all are doing. Um, I'm doing an abbreviated thing for instructors of here's the major things to learn. So we'll just be seeing on it. Now, you're going to have to, Simon, This is you got to do two finals in this class. One is this hands-on, which you should get hundreds on, because you're going to have built the cables for me here at the mid term area and i've called it a midterm one on it but i don't necessarily always fall to middle of the term um and midterm actually isn't for another two weeks i guess um and then but you do have a lab final that you do it again um there's one when you do it at midway here i'll be teaching you how to do it showing you working with you on it and assisting y'all and you can get all the assistance you want. It's to get the three cables built. Um, and that is a learning experience. When you do it at the end, you'll have already built the cables one time, remember? And that your assignment at that point is you got to build the three without assistance.
However, the color codes I will have for you a chart with them on it. And if you have some notes, you can bring and use any notes. But you can't use, I'd say your friend Google, but reading through y'all's um, post from the other week on the discussion between the students, Google's not apparently a friend of a lot of y'all that y'all don't like on where they've sold some information, been alleged to, et cetera, on it. Um, but you can't go out and search for whatever search engine you want to use. Um, it doesn't make any difference. You can't use search engine. You can't use the Internet when you do that final. You can't ask me or ask your classmates for help or whatever. If you do, you'll lose points. However, you can ask me if I ask you this, will I lose points if you answer it? And I will tell you if it would lose you points. Sometimes y'all have a question on something that we didn't really cover on it or whatever. And that'll give you the answer too, and not cost you any points. So um, I do give y'all the option on that of asking me if you ask me, will it cost me points? All right. I hope that cleared it up a little bit. So I'll be getting a schedule out for that sometime soon, but it may be later this week or it may be next week before I get something out on it. But we'll just see, and then we'll work work on it on getting times between all of us together on it. Um, and I say I will travel to other campuses to meet students on it also. Um, and then the other part is if you can come in on Tuesday, on whichever day we do it on, which will be a Tuesday or Thursday in my hybrid classes, um, that um, that would be nice also where I do the morning at Walker and the afternoon at um, Dalton. Um, that, that'll be an option for you also. So, yes, you do have um a final you've got a final that is similar is like your test you're taking each one of your tests and you're going to do the second one this week on um, four through seven it's due next monday um you've got a final that's like that that you go in and answer all those questions that's 10 percent of your grade and you've got a lab final which is doing the cabling that we were just talking about and you get to use test tool and everything and like when you go to turn the one in at the end of doing the cabling you test it and everything and make sure it works right before you turn it into me so typically everybody makes hundreds on that part um now the written final that's a different situation and it covers the whole class it's again done by cisco just like the other tests you're taking and so and y'all can actually go back and review on your previous test um they're sitting out there where you can actually go back and look at them so um they're at the netiquette site did that answer question for you simon Okay, any other questions for me? All right, the 2601. I don't know, Heather, I haven't put those in yet. I've put a few in, but here's what I've got right now. That I've got all of these piled here, including ones mailed to me, a ton of in our office, and some blank ones down in here. And so I think I remember having seen something on yours, but I don't know. Um, so I'll get those put in. I've started putting a few in, but I'm trying to do some grading instead. Um, okay, 2601, since it was at 10, it's still at 10 o'clock. Yes, Skylar. Because I don't know what times I've got these at. But the 9, 10, and 11 o'clock session is still, all of those are at normal time today. It's just the 1 and 2 o'clock session had to change. And then now where I'm teaching the 24, 11 class. For today, I have put them tonight on um, 8 o'clock. But I don't know where I'm going to put them starting next week. And then I put the... 1220, I believe it is, or 2550, one of those two. Um, I don't remember which one. Whichever one was the one at two o'clock, that one is on Wednesday night this this week at eight o'clock. All right. So um the 2601 is still at whatever time we had it on. I didn't change that. The only ones I got changed was the two of them at one and two o'clock, because I don't have to be over to the school there until registration starts at 1230. So I can get these all done and then go over there 
through the 11 o'clock one and then go and start attending my meeting. All right. Any other questions? Because we're running up on 45 minutes at this point and I've got the next session at nine o'clock and then I'll see a couple of y'all at 10 o'clock. Or normally it's the other way around to tell you when we finish the 10 o'clock session i tell you i'll see several of you at one o'clock and this is confusing to me too on this time switching but it's just something that had to be done so if you have any questions on anything send me emails and ask me i'm still getting things from students saying i fought and fought for a week trying to do such and such and I've tried to do it myself, but I couldn't get it done. And what in the world do I do? And my general rule to you is if you try to work on something, you can't get it working after 15 minutes of trying. Send me a note asking for assistance. Continue working on it. And hopefully I can get back to you very quickly. This semester, I'm not sometimes as quickly able to get back to you. Like today on Mondays, even normally, I've got these and when I'm in these, obviously, I can't be answering email. And then this afternoon, where I would have some more chance, I won't be able to. So it'll be this evening before I really answer on that. <clears throat> Although I am going to look at emails right after we get off the session. And I'll be doing the same throughout the morning. Um, so I try to get back to you all real quickly. I answered all my email all weekend from students and answered several people with different problems. All right. Talk to y'all next week. I am going to exit out of here. Um, turn the recording off. Did anybody else join us? It doesn't look like anybody else joined us. It's just the three of y'all and I'll get y'all scores hopefully out there later today.